you for that glorious truth that uh, our faith is built upon a, a solid foundation, uh, your word that uh, works effectually, uh, your word that will not come back void. We do thank you, Father, for uh, the time that we can spend together, one with each other, as we rejoice around your wisdom, your eternal purpose, and as we now continue here, especially in Romans chapter 9, may uh, we once again understand our proper place in history, and may we uh, have a clear understanding uh, as to how you worked uh, in the past and what you intend to do through that uh, people, uh, that nation, uh, the nation of Israel. And, of course, we ask these things in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Romans chapter 9. We're good. Okay, and, and once again, welcome to those folks watching on the Internet as well. Uh, a little bit of concern regarding uh, websites being hacked. It appears as though things are running uh, okay so far. Romans chapter 9, we're going to pick it up here now, verses 6 through verse 13. I have a little chicken scratch behind me. And what we're going to be examining this morning is a, uh, a doctrine, a principle that is established in the uh, Old Testament. And it regards uh, not just Israel, but it's really going to deal with two types of Israel. And that's what we're going to be examining, especially here this morning. So we're going to pick it up, Romans chapter 9, beginning at verse 6. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but... In Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, yet Esau have I hated. Uh, kind of a, a nice chunk of uh, passage here that we're going to be looking at, but all of it is an answer to an objection, uh, a real objection that is being made regarding the veracity of Almighty God, regarding the veracity of His Word. Now, remember, the Apostle Paul uh, is defending the book of Romans as a legal treatise. We've, uh, you know, sort of approached it with an understanding that it's sort of a courtroom drama, if you will. And there are a lot of questions being asked, but of course there are a lot of answers to those questions. Well, Romans chapters 9 through 11, God is now going to defend himself against uh, some accusations that are being made regarding his person specifically his word. Now you recall, as we began chapter 9, Israel is cut off. Israel is accursed. Her place and position with Jehovah has now fallen. Israel has fallen. Israel now has lost that special place of favor and privilege with God. So uh, what Paul is doing here especially is, is demonstrating that what God is doing today is in light of his right to ultimately change the program, which he obviously did. The reason God has changed the dispensational program is because uh, Israel lost her status. And in the opening verses, you know, verses 4 and 5 especially, you notice how Paul lists the privileges that were Israel's. And as uh, Newell once uh, said, or I should say as Newell wrote, listen, religious privilege is not the same as spiritual reality. All right. Spiritual privilege, uh, uh, religious privilege, I should say, religious privilege is no guarantee that one experiences the spiritual reality. Verses 4 and 5 demonstrate Israel's religious privilege. Remember to Israel promised the adoption and the uh, glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. Uh, so on, verse 5, uh, of whom concerning the flesh Christ came. So Israel was given tremendous uh, privilege. And yet, through all of that, or in spite of all that privilege, 
Israel failed to recognize the Lord Jesus Christ as the fulfillment of the prophetic scriptures regarding the coming Messiah, the anointed one, so on and so forth. Okay, so uh, in light of Israel's current status, having lost her status, being cut off, being accursed, and we commented on the use of that word accursed in verse Three, that is the status of Israel today. She is accursed. Now there are these three objections, these three accusations. The first accusation or objection is here in verse 6. Hey, God's word didn't work, did it? In other words, God's word is unreliable. The second objection is in verse 14. And the accusation is that God is being unrighteous in the way he's dealing with the nation of Israel. The third objection or accusation begins in verse 19. And uh, what we have is God being accused of being unreasonable. Uh, God is not being reasonable when he just changes the program with Israel. So verses 6 through 13 is uh, the answer to this first accusation that perhaps God's word didn't work. Now, that's quite typical. When things go wrong in your life, isn't it quite natural to say what's wrong with God, right? But in reality, who's the problem? It's not God who's the problem. It's the people. So what Paul's going to demonstrate is, listen, God's word historically has always worked. Now, that's what Paul's going to say here. Wait a minute. God said, Israel, you're given the adoption, the glory, the service, so on and so on and so forth. They, they have it. It hasn't materialized. All of the promises, all of the hope, all of the common wealth that God said is Israel's, it hasn't happened yet. Why and who's at fault? Well, maybe God's word wasn't effective. God's word was effective, as Paul is going to demonstrate. The problem is Israel was defective. See the, the difference here? God's word is always effectual. The problem is the people are defective because they're operating in the realm of unbelief. And that's what Paul's ultimately going to demonstrate here, okay? The answer ultimately is this. God's word did work. Okay, for 1,500 years or so, the ultimate hope never materialized. How then can you say God's word was working the whole time? God's word did work. His dealings with Israel did succeed in accomplishing, and this is very critical, in accomplishing his eternal purpose, in accomplishing his elective purpose. Now, we're using this uh, theological hand grenade here, election, okay? What Paul's going to demonstrate is God has an elective purpose that was being carried out in Israel's history. For now, look there at verse 11. This is the theological uh, uh, landmine, if you will. In verse 11, For the children, being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand. Now, let me comment real briefly here. The word election. Oh, my. The Augustinian Calvinistic theological definition of election, uh, which is nothing but the covenant theological definition of election. And then it deteriorates into all sorts of radical forms of covenant theology and radical, the uh, radical uh, Calvinism and so on and so forth. Do you notice verse 11 does not say that God's elective purpose causes someone to be good or someone to be evil. Verse 11 does not say that God's elective purpose causes someone to produce the works. Now, this is extremely important because the radical use of the word election Ultimately, and again, it, you know, you got all sorts of different shades and flavors, but ultimately there is this theological belief that God has elected Renee to go to hell, but God has elected Christine to go to heaven. 
And therefore, God in his sovereignty, he's the one who, in his elective purpose, decided that Rene will produce the evil and Christine will produce the good works. And therefore, God is an absolute sovereign, complete control to every minutia, detail and event and circumstance and thought and so on and so on and so on and so forth. Right. How in the world can you read verse 11? Look at verse 11 again for the children being not yet born. Now they're having done any good or evil. You know what Paul is demonstrating here? God's elective purpose is independent of anyone doing good or evil. I, I, do you see the difference? What, what we're going to see here, Paul is saying, listen, God has an elective purpose and it's independent of whether one is doing good or one is doing evil. So the idea that God's elective purpose is to cause someone to do evil or cause someone to do good is a fabrication. It's a lie. And uh, it's a very commonly taught doctrine in Christian circles, by the way. And uh, hopefully we're going to try to uh, correct some of the error and the uh, heresy that all too often surrounds the idea of election. So uh, God's word did not fail, but rather God's elective purpose was being carried out throughout Israel's history. Now, I have here's the chicken scratch. You uh, again, very rough. Draw. Here we have Israel as a whole, right? But do you notice out of Israel, there is what the Bible, I'm going to call it the remnant doctrine or a remnant principle. That is out of Israel at large, Israel in general, there is a true Israel. There are two components to God's elective purpose. And I'm going to state it now and then we're going to go through all these verses. OK, God's elective purpose. Number one. God has elected to create a, a, a literal, physical nation called Israel. All right. We, we know there is a literal, physical, biological nation of Israel that has its ethnic um, um, origins with Abraham. OK, a real seed line. But what God is demonstrating in history, and it comes to greatest clarity during the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ, is that all along, God is calling out a spiritual nation. The two components, yes, number one, there is a literal physical nation that are, and it consists of literal, literal physical descendants of Abraham, but... God is saying they're not the ones that are by default going to inherit all of the commonwealth and the hope and the prophetic promises. Rather, what God is demonstrating is there is a second type of Israel. Look at verse six again. But not as though the word of God had taken on effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. So you notice there are two types of Israel, correct? Wait, there is an Israel. But they're not all Israelites. So the second component is understanding that there is this spiritual people. You see, it isn't enough to be a biological descendant. One must be spiritually usable unto God. One must have spiritual life. One must be spiritually fit and again, usable Unto God. You see, God's word was working all along because God was isolating and singling out and distinguishing from among the ranks of the literal biological nation a seed, a generation, a people, a remnant. The Lord Jesus Christ calls them the little flock. Moses calls it the foolish nation. You see, God, God's word is working. You see, we have the one nation that is puffed up in pride and narcissistic arrogance. And Moses, as the prophet of Israel, says, you know what God's going to do with that biological nation? God's going to use a foolish nation 
An insignificant nation, one that is not built up with puffed up, arrogant, narcissistic pride and and religious self-righteousness, but one that responds foolishly to what God says. And now Paul's going to demonstrate, don't you don't anyone. And he is dealing with Jews. Remember, it was uh, quite common of him to go to the synagogues. And you better believe the uh, objection and the accusation is, well, wait a minute. Boy, I guess God's word just didn't work. Don't don't ever. God's word didn't work. Now. Prophecy, it didn't come to fruition. It, It didn't happen yet. The breakdown is never God's word. And, and, you know, over and over again, I, you, you, I'm sure most of you know Hebrews chapter. The word of God is quick and powerful, powerful. There is an energy, a dynamic. There's a there's a, a, a power. God's word does work. It's quick. It's powerful. Go to Isaiah. I mean, I just want to run a few verses to demonstrate. Don't ever. I'm not saying you here. <laughs> But for anyone to suggest that God's word somehow was inferior and it lacked a capacity that God's word lacked the ability to accomplish God's purpose is a flat lie. God's word was working. Isaiah chapter 55. I mean, I just I just enjoy reading some of these verses that, again, emphasize and highlight the genius of God. That is vested in his word. Uh, Sunday night, last Sunday night, mentioned, um, you know, when when Paul talks about the power of God, it's linked to the word of God. Okay, Isaiah chapter 55. Notice there in verse 11, Isaiah 55, verse 11. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void but it shall accomplish that which I please and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Okay, then where's the kingdom? Okay, how do you reconcile verse 11? But where's the kingdom? Didn't prophecy continually say a kingdom, an earthly kingdom? And didn't Jesus Christ even say the kingdom of heaven is at hand? Where is it? That verse says, my word shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I what? Is it God's pleasure to establish a Davidic literal kingdom in the land of Palestine through which there will be the reign of righteousness? Where is it? Can we now say, well, maybe God's word didn't return. It didn't work. Ah, How is God's word working? That's what Paul's doing here. If you're looking at the fulfillment of all of the prophetic hope, it hasn't happened. Is it because God's word was ineffective? No, God's word was working. How? How is God's word working? If the verse says, my word will not come back void. uh, Wait a minute. It looks like nothing but failure. But God's pleasure His elective pleasure was to isolate that believing remnant from within the ranks of an unbelieving nation. You see, God's word is working, right? It's working by identifying those who are responding by faith. And anyone who says, no, God's word didn't work because the kingdom wasn't established. uh, They're making a serious mistake. As Paul is demonstrating Romans chapter nine, Uh, go to um, look, look, go to since we're in Isaiah chapter 59, go to Isaiah chapter 59. And and even Isaiah, he he basically identifies what the core problem is uh, among Israel. Isaiah chapter 55, I'm sorry, 50, 59, I'm sorry, uh, 59, verse 14. And judgment is turned away backward and justice standeth afar off for truth is fallen in the street. Now, that's that's the uh, the situation in Israel. Instead of truth being exalted, instead of truth, go to go to Psalms chapter one hundred thirty eight. Instead of God's word being valued, honored and esteemed. You know what it means when the truth has fallen into the street. Now, we live in uh, 
you know, in, in, in modern time. We all have plumbing, I'm assuming, unless you live in Huntley. Uh, I'm just kidding, Dave. Um, we, we enjoy the conveniences of modern plumbing, right? You, you know how uh, prior to the conveniences of, my, of modern plumbing, uh, what did most people do with their uh, waste product? whether it's in uh, medieval times and, and so on. Uh, you, you know what you threw out into the street? You know what Israel is doing to the word of Almighty God? God says, you know what, you're, you're treating my word as, hu- as waste. And when, it's, when, when, when Isaiah says it's fallen on the street, it's just like waste. And it's trampled upon to take God's word. And to devalue it like that, in in Psalms chapter 138, look there at verse, uh, well, let's read verse 1. I will praise thee with my whole heart before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word. Above all thy name. Who ultimately is going to magnify God's word? Here you have this unbelieving nation of Israel. Stubborn, rebellious, hard-hearted, stiff-necked. And they value God's word no more than a waste product being dumped on, on the street to be trampled upon. And it isn't until the Lord Jesus Christ, by the way, in Psalms 138, when he establishes that glorious temple during that kingdom reign, that he, Jesus Christ is going to magnify thy word above all thy name. Listen, the regenerated nation of Israel, that foolish people, that foolish nation, they're the ones that value God's word. They're responding by faith to God's word. Psalms 138, by the way, is a uh, millennial description of how God's word will once again be held in high, uh, you know, Isaiah or Jeremiah talks about uh, the ministry of Jesus Christ. You, you know, the ministry. Go to Jeremiah chapter twenty-three. The ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm sorry. Go to Isaiah forty-two. <laughs> go to Isaiah chapter forty-two. Isaiah chapter forty-two. Uh, interesting. The Lord Jesus. Remember how many times the Lord Jesus Christ kept saying, "Ye do err, not knowing what the scriptures." Remember how many times the Lord Jesus says, "Have ye not read?" Over and over again. You know what the Lord Jesus Christ is doing? He's confronting Israel and their lack of love towards the word of God. Why aren't they magnifying the word of God? How come you guys aren't reading it? How come you're not searching it? The Lord even said, search the scriptures. You think you have eternal life. And you know what the scriptures are describing? Jesus Christ said, they're talking about me. Search it, read it, study it. But he says, why aren't you doing it, Israel? Again, he's he's confronting Israel. He's challenging Israel. In Isaiah chapter 42, here's a description of what the Lord Jesus is doing. In Isaiah 42, verse 21, the Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. He will magnify the law. What's the insinuation here? Is Israel doing it? They're not doing it. He will magnify the law and make it what? Honorable. Right at the the first public address by the Lord Jesus Christ. He went on a hill. Remember that? Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount. And what did he do? Now, of course, I, I think it's so touching. He first, he comforts the suffering Little flock, by the way. Remember, he says, blessed be, blessed be, blessed be, blessed be that suffer for righteousness sake here. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ, the first thing he does is address the faithful who are suffering at the hands of the unfaithful. The ones, again, they had religious privilege, but they didn't have the spiritual reality. So Jesus Christ looks at that foolish people and he says, listen, blessed, blessed. Blessed, blessed. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't there an interesting parallel in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1? Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. 
We are blessed with all spirit. You, you know what? Our Heavenly Father wants us to understand that. Listen, we are blessed. Completely complete. Fully forgiven. Eternally blessed. We can't lose it. It's re- regardless of what we do. Regardless of what we don't do. You can't sin your way out of it. You can't offend God out of it. Bless. You're blessed. So the Lord Jesus, he tells that little flock, listen, blessed are the righteous, blessed are the meek, blessed are they that hunger, blessed are the righteous. And then what does he say after that? He says, I, I didn't come to destroy the law. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ is being accused of what? Destroying the law. Jesus, I didn't come to destroy the law. I've come to fulfill. And then he says, not one jot or tittle shall pass. And then what does the Lord Jesus says? Yea, unless your righteousness exceed that superficial righteousness of who? The Pharisees. Now, question. How do you exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees? Remember what Paul said as touching the righteousness, which is of the law. Paul said, I was what? Blameless. How do you exceed a Pharisee who confesses when it comes to the righteous demands of the law, I am blameless. The only way you can exceed it is if you have God's righteousness. See, God looked Saul of Tarsus, a man who bragged about being righteous. But he lacked the righteousness of God. Because you have Israel in this obstinate rejection, pitting their self-righteous. Again, religious privilege against the... See, the only way when Jesus Christ says, unless your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees, the only way is, hey, you need whose righteousness? You need God's righteousness. And then the Lord... He magnifies the word. He is going to make the word honorable. You know how he makes the word honorable? Yea, it has been said. Thou shalt not commit adultery, right? But I say unto you. By the way, that's why Israel deemed him worthy of stoning by death, right? Remember, the law says this, but I say. So what is he implying here? Anything coming out of my mouth will supersede what? The written law of God, which was in the hands of Israel for 1,500 years. How dare this guy suggest that what he says would ever supersede what was written? Hey, John tells us why Jesus Christ has that right. Is he not the living word? Who's the author of that law written in stone? The Lord Jesus. So now you have the author and writer of that law system who is there in flesh and blood. And he says, I'm going to magnify the law. I'm going to honor the law. I'm going to say, yeah, you know, you heard it. It was written, right? But I say unto you, man, you even lust after a woman. You've already committed adultery in your heart. You see how he made it honorable? What he's pressing about, uh, upon the nation of Israel is this. Listen, righteousness that is resting in one's own self, righteous effort works isn't enough. The Lord Jesus says, what's going on inside of you? That's what's lacking. That's what's missing. Now, what does that all have to do with Romans chapter 9? Paul is saying, don't say that God's word is of none effect. The problem is not God's word. The problem is the response of God's word, in this case, in Israel's history. Israel didn't operate by faith. They operated in unbelief. Isaiah 66. We'll just stay in the book of Isaiah. Man, there are passages in Psalms, Jeremiah, so forth. Isaiah chapter 66. Uh, look at this. Isaiah chapter 66. And uh, in Isaiah chapter 66, verse uh, 5. Isaiah 66, verse 5. Hear the word of the Lord. Ye that tremble at his word. Did you catch that? Now, that's, that, that's certainly in contrast to the truth that, that is fallen where? In, the, I mean, in effect, practically, regarding God's word as filth. God says, hear the word of the Lord, ye that tremble at his word. Your brethren that hated you and cast you out for my name's sake, said, let the Lord be glorified, but he shall appear to your joy and they shall be ashamed. So we're, we're, we're not getting into all the, the details right now, but what a, what a glorious characteristic regarding the true Israel of God. 
the spiritual, the second type of Israel, the one who is now truly spiritual, usable by Almighty God, because they do what God is looking for, a heart of faith that trembles, that is touched, that recognizes that God's word is valuable. It needs to be magnified. It needs to be honored. It needs to be esteemed. Now, that's the attitude and that's the spirit. Going back to Romans chapter 9, that sadly is found wanting in the ranks of biological, physical Israel. So Paul now, he's going to press on this two, compo- this two type Israel doctrine. Verse 6 again, not as though the word of God has taken an effect. Listen, well then how, how was God's word working? Okay. How was God's word working the whole time? Well, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Okay, so right away. Okay, before we answer the question, well, then how was God's word working? We need to understand there are two types of Israel. Verse 7. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called... Do you see God's wisdom working? God's wisdom in regards to his elective purpose with the nation of Israel was already operating back there in the book of Genesis. When he's dealing with Abraham. In fact, it's called the word of prompt. Look at verse nine. For this is the word. Oh, and they don't accuse God's word of not working. It's working all right. Verse 9, for this is the word of what? Promise. God in his infinite wisdom. He already planned and electively purposed the formation and the creation of a spiritual nation. And God was already setting in motion his word. That was going to operate in such a way that the believer is going to disassociate themselves from the overall general apostasy plaguing the nation of Israel. They're going to be the ones who tremble at the word of God. They're the ones who are going to believe God's word. And they're the ones that are going to be accounted as members of this foolish people. This second Israel, if you will, this this second nation or type of nation. Um, Verse seven, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. This is, that is they, which are the children of the flesh. These are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. So here's God's word working There is, uh, by way of representation, a nation called Israel that is described as flesh. Now, that's in contrast to a nation which is going to be the result of the spirit. One nation that is going to be described as existing because of works, but a nation which is described to exist because of promise, not because of what you can attain, achieve and and accomplish, but rather because of what God says he is going to do for them. God is already setting in motion a principle, a doctrine, a system where he says, unless I do it for you, you're doomed. Now, with that in mind, Do you understand what Paul's ultimately going to do in this third section? Does God have the right to do that again? To declare, I'm going to do for someone what they can never, ever achieve on their own. And I'm going to do it because of the veracity of my own character. And I do it not because you deserve it. And not because you do not deserve it. But regardless of what you deserve. 
Does God have a right to turn to a group of people that have no hope, that are aliens, that are strangers, that are without Christ, that are without God? Does God have a right to go to those who have been abandoned by God and in effect say, I have a right to do for you what you can never do for yourself? What Paul's doing here in this third section is saying, listen, Israel, God did something with Israel as a people group. And guess what God can do dispensationally? He can turn to hell-bound Gentiles that are dead in trespasses and sins and in the uncircumcision of of their flesh. And God now can reveal another elective purpose. When you come across the word election, verse 11, it has nothing to do with individual salvation. It has nothing to do with God determining whether you're going to do good works and go to heaven or you're going to do evil works and you're going to go to hell. God's elective purpose has everything to do with what he intends to do for all of eternity. And God, who respects free will, you can respond and jump on the bus with him. Okay, the bus is going. The bus is going to establish a little earthly kingdom on the earth. We now know, of course, obviously, the bus is going to uh, uh, install in the heavenly places a new creature. And God says, you can jump on the bus. How? By faith. Has nothing to do with women. I never issued you a ticket. Let's see, now I'm going to go back there to the record book and eternity path. You know, sorry, David Spruill, you know, your name, I didn't write you in. You're doomed. You see how theology screws up that whole concept of election. No, God's determined to do something. And then God in his grace and goodness invites people to join him. Okay. And so one reason why Paul's going to be making these arguments is because it's going to provide powerful testimony. Because when we get to the third, when we get to the third objection and and Paul's going to demonstrate, guess what? Well, let's go to the third objection, because this is Paul nails them. Now, again, this is God's word. God's going to nail anyone who makes these accusations. Go, go, go to the end of chapter nine. Look at verse 30. What shall we say then? OK, Paul's making all these arguments. Verse 30. What are we going to say then? That the Gentiles which follow not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith, but Israel. You you see what Paul's ultimately going to be doing here? He's going to demonstrate, hey, if historically God was always calling out a people that first need to be spiritually usable, guess what God's doing in the dispensation of the grace of God? There's a parallel situation here, okay? Only this time, He's going to the masses and he's now doing something different. He's calling out from among the Gentiles, those that respond by faith to be participant in another elective purpose. Remember in Romans eight, we talked about that elective purpose. Go to Romans chapter eight. You mean God can have two elective purposes? Is he God? (laughs) Can God have three? Can God have God can have as many elective purposes as he wants, right? Well, God does have another elective purpose, as we studied in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow. Now, this verse is talking about who? The church, the body of Christ. I'm not talking about, oh, I foreknew David onto eternal life. Okay, that's what theology does. God's elected. Listen, I'm going to create a new creature, a new agency, one new man comprised not of Jew and Gentile. Remember, uh, there is no Jew, Gentile, bond, free, male, female, so on and so forth. Verse 29, for whom he did foreknow. He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his. You know what God's elective purpose is to take these dead Gentiles consigned to Satan. And ultimately conform them into the image of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Is he a good God? And does he do it because we deserve it? Because we earned it? You see that? No. Uh-uh. uh-uh. Conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Verse 30, moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. 
what should we say to these things? <laughs> what, what can we say to these things? God has an elective purpose. We now know there is a heavenly elective purpose, okay? But Paul, going back now to Romans chapter 9, so l- let's now look at how it is God's word was working. As we go back now to, to Romans chapter 9, and uh, look at verse 8 again. That is, they which are the fle- uh, children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise. God's, it's called the word, verse 9, the word of promise. Was God's word working? God's word was working. We said, hey, Abraham, Ishmael's not the guy. Sarah, I'm, and Abraham, don't get me wrong, I'm going to give you a son. Is that God's word? It, is it going to work? You better believe it worked because God set in motion in his infinite genius a, a system whereby the only ones in Israel's program that can ever participate in what God is doing is they first have to be spiritually qualified. Can anybody make themselves spiritually qualified to be used of God? Remember what Paul said, touching the righteousness which the law, I am blameless, and yet... He didn't have the righteousness that exceeded the righteousness of the Pharisees. So God's word is working. It is. It is. God's word is setting in motion this two type nation. And now Paul's going to expand and develop this verse nine. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebecca also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. Oh, God's word. It's now going to create a literal, physical, biological people. But at the same time, God's word is going to equip that foolish nation to become spiritually usable for God's eternal purpose, obviously vested on the earth, okay? This remnant doctrine, this is something Israel failed to understand. They're trampling on the word of truth. They didn't understand God is calling out from among their ranks. You see, God's word is working. What's God doing? Hey, Don't identify with the flesh. Identify with what I am doing in and through Isaac as a child of promise. Go back to Isaiah. Let's let's look how this this doctrine of uh, I'm going to call it just just for my own convenience, I guess, the remnant doctrine, the two Israel doctrine, Isaiah chapter 65, Isaiah chapter 65. And um the prophets already anticipated and, and they uh, already predicted uh, to Israel that there is a true Israel and then there is a false fleshly Israel. Isaiah chapter 65 and uh, verse 9. Isaiah 65 verse 9. And I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob... And out of Judah, an interior of my mountains, and mine elect. Now, remember, jettison the theological nonsense regarding election. He's not saying those that I've elected to have eternal life. Mine elect, God's elective purpose, which is, verse 9, I will bring forth a seed. What's his elective purpose? There's going to be a seed coming out of Jacob. Now, by the way, you see it's Jacob. Why is that critically important? Uh, In Romans 9, this is how Paul is going to list the genealogy. Paul goes from Abraham to who? How many sons did Abraham have? Or at least the two biggies. (laughs) Okay, who was his firstborn son? Uh, who Who was born before Isaac? Ishmael. Okay, remember Ishmael? Now, and then, of course, Isaac. And then Isaac, he has two sons that Paul is going to identify. From Isaac, you have, as this verse is describing, who? Jacob, right? Now, but wait a minute. Isaac, there was an older brother to Jacob. Who was Jacob's older brother? 
listed in Romans 9. Uh, his name was what? Esau. Out of Esau, so you have Abraham who has Ishmael. Now, and then, of course, he has Isaac. Isaac has Jacob. Jacob has, uh, uh, Isaac has another son, Esau. Out of Esau comes the Edomites or Edomites. And then Jacob, you have, quote, the nation of Israel. So Paul in Romans 9, he's going to identify the true lineage, okay? Uh, he goes from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob to Israel, okay? Uh, he makes reference to the flesh. That's Ishmael. Paul's going to say, God hates Esau. Now, what do these uh, Augustinian Calvinistic, theolo- you know, what, what do they say about God hating someone and loving another? Oh, God loved Christine so much. You're going to heaven. Sorry, Renee. I don't like you a whole lot. It's some kind of foolishness. When God says, I hate Esau, that was 1400 years after Esau was born. Why would God, 1,400 years later, say, uh, Esau, I hate, but Jacob, I love, okay? And, and Paul's going to demonstrate what's going on. Because what God is doing is he's isolating the true Israel. That's what he's doing here, okay? Now, here in Isaiah chapter 65, verse 9, And I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob. You see how God carefully, precisely, um, uh, he, he is now isolating the true seed. It begins with Abraham, and then it begins to a miracle baby. Isaac was a miracle, right? Not only was Abraham impotent, but Sarah's womb was what? Dead. And God says, I'm going to, isn't that typical of God? God can create life out of what? Death. Science can't do that. So, so God says, okay, uh, Abraham, you're impotent. Uh, uh, Sarah, your womb is dead. I'm going to give you a miracle child. I'm going to give you a miracle baby. That's Isaac, okay? But now Isaac had two boys, and the problem was the older guy, Esau, you know, uh, you know, he, he hated his birthright, and we're going to go to that in a second. So God says, I'm going to isolate it. I'm going to narrow it down to, to who? To Jacob. He's the younger one. Jacob, we're going to find out. You know that Jacob always valued the birthright? We're going to go back to Genesis and that that incident where, you know, big brother uh, Esau, he's starving and so on and so forth. Don't ever read it as though, you know, on a whim, on a whim, Esau, you know, I'm hungry, I'm starving, you know, I haven't eaten for a few days. And on a whim, Jacob says, I know what I'm going to do. I know. You know what? Jacob in his heart valued the birthright that wasn't his. But more importantly, Hebrews tells us that Esau was profane. Now, it doesn't say that he became profane because he hated the birthright. You know, we, you know what Esau, it doesn't say how, Esau all the time in his heart never valued the birthright. Now, if you were Donald Trump's heir or Bill Gates' heir, is there some evidence and testimony that, man, you got some pretty good things that are coming down the pike here, potentially? I understand Bill Gates is kind of a mean guy, but let's just say, I mean, you know, you, you, you're walking in the property. You're see, you, know, you can visually see the riches. You have the bank statements, okay? Imagine being in the desert, and, uh, and Isaac says, Esau, one day this will all be yours. And you turn, and what do you see? Sand. And you see toil. You understand what's happening here, okay? Son, one day, you know, kind of the joke, right? Son, one day, this is all going to be yours. Well, you know what? I don't want that. You know, who says I want all of that stuff? So in Esau's heart was already predisposed against the birthright. He didn't see the value in it. He didn't, he didn't see the honor in it. Oh, great, I get to inherit a bunch of sand and camels and whatever, you know. We'll, we'll. So, so we're, when we go back there, Paul's going to go back there, and we're going to just see a couple of things there. Well, God says, no, 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 I'm going to the one who is valuing what I am doing. Jacob values 
the hope and the promises that God made to his grandfather, Abraham, that in turn, by the way, God, Jehovah, God appears to Abraham. He appears to Isaac and he appears to Jacob. And each appearance in all three appearances, God reaffirms that I'm going to fulfill my covenant with you. So Jacob already knew and learned something about what God told Abraham. Evidently, Esau, big deal. Big deal. You know what? I wasn't there. How do I know? How do I know Gramps isn't maybe, you know, a little too much sun, you know. And then all of a sudden his dad is telling him some things about, yeah, God appeared to me too. Okay. And, it, but, you know, Jacob, he believed it. He believed what his granddad was saying. He believed what his father was saying. And Jacob, he, his heart, but you know what? He didn't have access to it because he was not the firstborn. You see that? So God's word, and I know time is fine. You know, want to see how God's word works? So remember, what is the accusation in Romans 9? Pfft, word of God is not effect then, right? Oh, no, God's word is working because you see what God's going to do. God, he says, you know, the elder is going to serve who? The younger. God's word is working, isn't it? God has an elective purpose. He is already doing things in light of what he is ultimately going to achieve and establishing and creating a spiritually usable nation. God's word is working. You see, it isn't working the way Israel wanted his word to work. See, that's the unbelief, isn't it? And that's the core problem. So Paul's going to narrow it down. And, and of course, as we just read here in verse 9, it's going to be a seed out of Jacob. Right, just keep that in mind. Go to chapter 66. God is now, he's, there's this principle, the seed. It's a remnant. They're isolating, distinguishing a true nation from that fleshly nation. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 8. Who hath heard such a thing? Isn't that interesting? Remember, what's the accusation? God's word doesn't work, right? Who, who's ever heard of such a thing? You see, faith? Well, verse 8. Who hath heard such a thing? Who hath seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? Uh-oh. Now, isn't that interesting? Shall a nation be born? Remember what the Lord Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter uh, three. Remember that. A man, unless ye be, unless a man be born again, you remember, ye must be ye nation, ye must be born. You see how God's word is already working in light of his eternal uh, purpose there and, and his elective purpose, God's saying, I'm going to call out a spiritual seed. And guess what? One day a nation is going to be, go to Joel, go to Joel and then go to Psalms. Okay, go to Joel. Now, Brother Richard, he's going through the book of Joel. And in Joel chapter 2, go to Joel chapter 2 and then Psalms chapter 22. Joel chapter 2 and then Psalms 22. In uh, Joel chapter 2, Joel chapter 2, notice there verse 32, okay? Joel, Joel 2 verse 32. There's Joel right now. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We don't want to embarrass anybody. Who is that? No. Joel chapter 2, Joel chapter 2 verse 32. Joel 2 32. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, past, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Oh, do you see the principle being established here? You see, uh, wait a minute. Is God calling a, God's calling a what? Remnant. Now keep this in mind. Romans 9, um, in Isaac... Shall thy seed be what? Called. It doesn't say I'm going to call Isaac your seed, Abraham. In Isaac, Abraham. So here's Abraham. In Isaac shall thy seed, Abraham. Wait a minute. What seed? The seed of promise. The seed of the spirit. In Isaac, I'm going to call the seed. See that? In Isaac. 
thy seed. Abraham's seed is going to be called through which lineage? Isaac. Why? Isaac's the miracle baby. Isaac's the product, the result of what? Promise. This is the remnant. God's word is working all along. God, in his infinite wisdom, he's saying, yeah, I'm going to call the one who believes me. I'm going to make those individuals a part of the true Israel of God. Psalms chapter 22. Psalms chapter 22 and verse 30. Psalms 22, verse 30. A seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born that he hath done this. Remember the accusation, oh, God's word isn't working. Hey, did Israel have access to Jeremiah, uh, to Isaiah? Did Israel have access to Joel? Did Israel have access to the book of Psalms? Remember what the Lord Jesus says, listen, Moses is writing about me. The prophets are writing about me. And, and the Psalms are writing about me. Israel had access to the doctrine of the remnant. They had access to the doctrine of the seed line. You know what a believing Israel, uh, Israelite who had trembled at God's word, he would have already understood, wait a minute. Problem over here, but God's looking to do something over here. God's word is working. They're looking in the wrong places. The Lord Jesus Christ, Matthew chapter uh, 3. Real quick, real quick, give me four minutes. Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. The Lord Jesus Christ takes the prophecies regarding the remnant and the seed and the generation and he brings it to, to uh, the forefront. He clarifies, if you will. He is now going to emphasize that that principle was there available. And the Lord Jesus now is there to commence bringing it to fruition. In Matthew chapter 3, look there. In Matthew chapter 3, remember here's John the Baptist in verse 6 and uh, regarding and, and were baptized of him, John, in Jordan, confessing their sins. Okay, verse 7 of Matthew 3. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees uh, come to his baptism, he said unto them, Oh, generation. Uh-oh. Now, why? He didn't say, Oh, you vipers. He says, You generation. John the Baptist, in keeping with the remnant doctrine, he's already using language that should have uh, set off a flag, an alarm. He's calling these guys a generation, okay? And that's an extremely important word in keeping with what the Old Testament is talking about. He's saying, listen, you snakes, you vipers, you crooks, you wolves, you frauds. Lord Jesus said, you are of your father, the who you see, it's the use of the word generation. It's the type and quality. Now, look there at verse nine and think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham, our father. Now, did he not just say you're a generation of snakes? And then he says, and don't you dare hide behind your ethnic lineage. And don't you dare say that you have Abraham of your father. And I love what he says in verse 9. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children. Say, Man, you talk about an insult. But did not God create a miracle baby? Out of what? Nothing. Any problem with God said to a rock, be thou my son? Now, there's a reason why he's saying it. Go to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. John chapter 1. John chapter 1. And look there at verse 11. John 1 verse 11. John 1 11. He came unto his own and his own received him not. But as many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Even to them which believe on his name which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of who? As God's word is always working. God is saying, remnant, seed, generation, the one, the ones who believe. And if they believe God's word in the past, should they have believed the claims of Jesus Christ at his appearing? Man. I've been studying Psalms, Lord. I've been studying Jeremiah. I've been studying Isaiah. I've been studying Joel. You're the one. You know what? 
I want to denounce my citizenry over here in this first nation. And I want now to be a part of uh, this citizenry, a new nation. You know what the Lord Jesus calls them? Oh, we got to stop, don't we? Go to Luke chapter 12. Go to Luke chapter 12. Um, Luke chapter 12. And uh, Luke chapter 12, verse 32. Luke chapter 12, verse 32. Luke 12, 32. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you what? The kingdom. Chapter 22, real quick, chapter 22. Now, we're, we're, we'll, we'll wrap it up here. Uh, Paul is over and over again going to demonstrate in Romans chapters 9 through 11, remnant, 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 remnant. God's word was working all right. You know what God's word was doing the whole time? Calling out the believing remnant. See that? And what's the accusation? God's word doesn't work, does it? No, your heart is defective. Your heart is deficient. God's word was carrying out God's elective purpose. The problem is you didn't want in on it. You wanted God to do it your way. Just like Genesis chapter 3. Luke chapter 22, verse 29. And I appoint unto you a kingdom. So he, of course, is talking to who? The little flock. And you know what the Lord is saying? Hey, you, and, and in Matthew, we'll, we'll pick it up next time. Math, in Matthew, the Lord Jesus says, hey, guys, you're the foolish nation. You're the ones. You're the ones that the prophets were talking about. You're the ones that the word of God touched and affected and caused you to tremble in, in believing response to what God's doing. So don't blame God's word. Father, we do thank you that your word does work effectually as we believe it to be the truth. We thank you, Lord, that especially in light of Israel's history, it, it was working. And yet it was the response of, of unbelief that uh, caused ultimately the failure and the casting away of, of your people. We do thank you, Lord, that we have your word. May we learn these lessons, but more importantly, may we understand how it is you can and you have changed the way you've dealt with human uh, history and uh, how it is you've ushered in a new elective purpose. Uh,